Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Your Legislators. I'm Anthony Murnau. Joining us for this episode is New Mexico District 39 Republican State Representative Luis Terrazas. Representative Terrazas is a member of the House Health and Human Services Committee, Labor Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, and House Enrolling and Engrossing Committee. He joins us now to talk about the recent legislative session and issues he has been working on. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative Terrazas. So thank you for having me here, Anthony. Thank you for having me here and be a, being a part of this. I think it's great that you um, give people an opportunity to see inside the Capitol. Uh, that was a bit restricted this year, so we appreciate that. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, this 30-day legislative session that ended recently was a budget-focused session. State lawmakers approved a nearly $8.5 billion budget. What are some things in this year's budget that you're really excited about for your district and the people of New Mexico? Well, in my district, I think we you saw some pay raises for teachers, and of course you saw some uh, pay raises for police officers. But in my district, um, as far as infrastructure, we are gonna finally get uh, uh some work done on highway 180 uh between uh, baird and and a little outside of uh hurley which will give us a four lane um highway the, the beginnings of phase one and two um that was very much needed there uh, over the years we've had accidents in that little corridor right there which literally shuts our ability to get in and out of town uh you'd have to go all the way to lordsburg and come back around um, that's not just for that reason, but if we have an emergency in Hurley or in, in that, those outs, we have no ability to get there. It's, it's kind of a, a tough thing. So those are the, as far as for my district, the, the highway is a big deal. Um, we have a lot of people that are, we're, are wanting that. And, um, so we'll, we'll have a pretty good uh, chunk of money going to help Grant County in that area. And again, uh, I think our police officers and our um, our uh, teachers get a nice raise, and there's some raises spread about throughout the state. Uh, I, I want to talk about that. that issue a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of concern, of course, about teachers in New Mexico, the shortage that is going on. How do you feel that the pay raises can help affect uh, retaining educators in your district? You know, Anthony, it, it, I think sometimes what happens is, um, and I, I'm gonna express this, I, I would love to see our legislators actually work together and listen to one another more. In my business as a funeral director, our job is to listen. Uh, it's just as important as expressing yourself. It's probably more important to listen. And, and to the point that you're making is sometimes we focus on just one thing and, and there's a variety of issues there uh, to retain teachers. Uh, I, I, it's pay is one of them, but, um, we have a lot of vacancies. Uh, are we competitive with other states? Um, one of the things that we talked about was return to work legislation. I fully supported return to work. Um, people call it double dipping, but there's ways to mitigate that where it's not your typical, um, double dipping. I, I think there was ways for us to help our teachers and our and our police officers and coming back to work after retiring they did we did pass some legislation that would give them a little uh, I think it was more for police officers that would allow them to uh, get bonuses after 5 10 15 years of service but I think those those are just one of the issues it's not all, entirely everything they need a work environment as a as a as an employer myself a work environment you can pay someone more but have an unhealthy work environment maybe that they're not comfortable in and so there has to be a balance of of many many things okay tell me a little um, bit about I, don't, I i'm trying to understand what you're saying though i mean what do you do you think there's an unhealthy work environment in the schools and well, education no, no not ex not no no not not just not in particular no sir but what i am saying is 
Um, let, let me go back and say, look, there are people that are retiring that cannot afford their health care. We'll just say that. We'll use that as unhealthy. Um, they're, they're retiring and all of a sudden they find themselves that they can't afford the health care. And, and so why are they going to work? Why are they continuing to work after they retire? Is specifically most of those people pay it, go to work so that they can pay their health care. And that's, that's an issue. Uh, police officers and teachers are doing that. So back to what I was saying about return to work, what I would have liked to have seen is allow some of these uh, state teachers and, and, and police officers come back to work. Um, they, would have, they would have contributed to PARA. We would have restricted at least, I think some of the bills were restricting three years of service after retirement. Um, my, my big thing is if you were a police officer, for instance, and you were in the state police, we'll just use them as an example, and you were a, maybe one of these, you had one of these higher uh, positions, a lieutenant, a captain, or whatever, you wouldn't, you, and you retired, and you had a, I think it's a 90 day rest period, you couldn't come back into the same position you had retained before. You would have to go start in an entry level position, which I think would have been wonderful for um, our younger officers to have a mentor working with them. Uh, probably reduce some of the, um, you know, some of the problems that you, uh, the learning experiences, you know, that you have as a new, uh, whether it's an officer, a teacher, uh, in my case, a funeral director, anything you do when you're new, just because you went to school, that you still have to get those life experiences that, that I think um, every person needs. And had they been able to return to work, they would have been able to, you know, stand next to them, work with them, hand in hand and say, look, you know, uh, maybe some of these dangerous situations that we're seeing with police officers and and uh, and the community or whatever uh, these situations that have, uh, have been you know you see. Uh, all right. So you're you're talking about police officers the need you think that it well, can make I'm a kinda, difference there. I'm, I, I'm trying to I, you know I was asking I, about educators so I kind of you know I understand the pivot and if you want to do that yes, that's sir. fine because there's a lot of issues that we can we can talk about with it. But when you're talking about educators, you're also talking about you know, a shortage and the pandemic impacting educators as well, who were already going to be retired soon. And up there in age that, you know, according to health officials, um, you know, during the pandemic, there was concerns for a lot of folks. So I, I'm kind of uh, wondering, you know, I, I understand where you're, where you're coming with the edu with the police officers, but um, with the educators, that's what I, I'd like to hear about. And I, I definitely want to talk about police no, no problem. coming up. No problem. I think I was trying to, to encompass, encompass all a return to okay. work because okay. we have shortages in, in teachers and, yeah. and police officers. And you're exactly right, Anthony. Um, teachers left uh, for different reasons. They were close to retirement and they said, you know what? This is scary. I'm going to go ahead and retire. This is not I don't want to be in that workforce at this at this time possibly because of the virus or uh, or they were just ready to retire. I don't know. But what I can tell you is that we have a big shortage. This return to work policy would have helped teachers come back. Um, it, it didn't pass and it's unfortunate that it didn't pass. Um, I would have liked to have seen in something to where we would have worked kind of like what I was talking about for police officers where it gives them an entry level, fill in some of the positions, get some of the people that have retired within the last, I don't remember what it was, 10, 15 years, give them an opportunity to come back to work and fill those positions for the next two or three years. That's important. And and so, you know, we're in trouble. We're in trouble um, in not just not just in, in, in that education, in education and police officers, but I walked into vital statistics in Santa Fe to see probably half to a little more than half of the cubicles empty. And so, I mean, state offices are, are empty. Um, and, and I don't want to divert out, I, I don't want to divert into all kinds of the private sector, but we're seeing a shortage in, in, in shortages of, of employees in all sectors. Yeah, there's been a lot of reporting about the great resignation that is going on. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of research and analysis and reporting on what may be causing that. Um, we've heard a lot of different ways how the pandemic ha may have been impacting that as well. And also people getting tired of um, not getting pay raises or you know, um, remote work 
changing the working environment. There's a lot of things we could talk about with that. Let's jump back to one thing you did bring up, and that is law enforcement, um, you know, because you, you serve in an area that has had trouble getting law enforcement officers within the mining district. There's been a lot of reporting with the folks from the Silver City Daily Press reporting about the shortage of law enforcement officers, shortage of leadership in law enforcement in some of those areas. What are some of the things that you worked on uh, during this legislative session to, to address that shortage? Yeah, and the return to work policies, uh, that was something that was, when we would have these, uh, I had a couple um, situations where we sat down and, and had public comment and sat down with, uh, with the sheriff and other um, municipalities their their uh, mayors and they all expressed the need for return to work and how they could get some of these officers back um, and fill in those positions through the throughout the mining district um, again you know it's, we have the sheriff trying to not only cover the, the county but having to come in and and take care of those small municipalities um, and so that's been a struggle for some time it's just become a real problem, severe problem in the last year, you know, where they lost um, their chiefs, they lost, um, I mean, they some, some of the municipalities didn't even have a single officer. Yeah. So big problems. I know that there were some communities that were joining together, um, forming community watch groups to try to get through uh, these times where they were very short on law enforcement officers. Of course, you mentioned uh, the Grant County Sheriff's Office having to cover a lot of uh, area that uh, didn't have uh, municipal law enforcement available at certain times. So I, I, I think this is going to be a story we'll, we'll be talking about more in the future. Obviously, finding law enforcement in rural communities um, you know, seems to be a challenge for a lot of places, not only in New Mexico, but across the country. Your thoughts on what else can be done to really address this issue? Well, I'm going to finish up with the return to work policies that we that we co-sponsored or I co-sponsored with some other. Uh, I had my own bill that I was going to put in, but the 30 day session, it's too short. And all we're doing is clogging the system with having repetitive bills that yeah. constantly are doing the same thing. I mean, you bring up so, a great point. You bring up a great point because the whole New Mexico legislature i mean there, there's been a lot of lawmakers that have voiced concerns about the way the legislature is is set up with a 30-day session trying to solve problems 60-day session trying to solve problems if you pull the lens back a little bit more you're going to have a conversation about lawmakers having enough time to really serve because they are unpaid there's been a call for lawmakers to be paid to serve so they can be a professional lawmaker working on for the people all year round. Your thoughts, do you think state lawmakers should be paid? Um, I personally don't wanna be paid. I mean, I'm not doing this for pay. Uh, I'm fortunate that I that I don't need to be paid and I, I'm doing this on a full uh, volunteer. Um, was it, that's my, my issues. I, I don't wanna be paid. I, I just, that's not what I'm there for. I mean, there's some, there are some, I know there's are, there are some lawmakers though that, that voice concerns that the way the system's set up, uh, the only people that can afford to run for elected office are people who are wealthy or retired, who can afford to take that time to, and dedicate it to serving communities. Of course, you don't have the paid staff throughout the year as well uh, in the New Mexico legislature. So, you know, if, if you don't have a paid legislature, how do you address some of these problems you think that the state faces? Because it's a challenging time. We're in the 21st century now, and this system was set up you know, uh, over 100 years ago to help serve New Mexicans. So what do you think can help uh, change this? Well, I'm going to tell you, I, I was super surprised whenever I went to the legislature and found out that I have to share a legislative assistant with another uh, legislator. Um, a person that, for, for instance, that had never worked in the legislature before, that person has a week of training prior to coming in. And so we're all learning, especially as a new legislator, everyone's learning that, you know, and we're leaning on other people that have been there a while. Uh, the, the nice thing is I was able to, after the first set, the first 60 day session, give me a good understanding of what is expected the next, the next time. And so I was ahead, this, the, you know, this, this 30 day session, but to that point, we had a lot of, we have a lot of legislators that struggle because our, and I'm not saying that they don't, 
you know, that we're not happy that we have a legislative assistant. It's just they're, they're only there a week before we get there. And some of them are new. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're just trying to um, get a job for, to put something on their, on their, um, let's just say on their, uh, yeah, resume employment or application. Or employment. Yeah, yeah their employment saying. application. And although they're wonderful people, um, you, you come into this fast paced situation and, and you're, and you're not only that, but you're sharing one with another legislator. So one legislator needs one thing, another, you know, they're, they're going to different committees than you are. So, um, that's, that's a problem. As far as pay to the legislators, you're, you're absolutely right. Some of them, uh, are absolutely, they're actually unemployed is what I understand. Some of them are literally have no employment whatsoever. And so they are i mean they're going up there with no finances and so forth i i think there has to be a balance you know in there uh where uh there's there are um legislators that need to be paid um i i myself uh and and keep in mind uh anthony i you know i i built a business from the ground up i so i i didn't have any money and i just but i created a business that I could afford to to finally give back to my community, but um, it wasn't easy. And 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 what? But what I am saying is, there are some of those that are their whole purpose is going to uh, community. Uh, I don't know organizing and and just legislation, but they have no financial backing. So I think some of them we should be paying some of them. I just won't support it because that's not what I'm there for, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, well, I'm sure this is a conversation that I'm sure we'll be discussing in the future. So I want to move on to another important issue. Obviously, the pandemic has impacted New Mexico in so many ways. Um, recently, New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham uh, removed the mask mandate for indoor spaces in the state. Uh, your thoughts on this and, um, and on the mask mandate? And I'd like to hear from you. Um, you serve on the um, House Health and Human Services, so it would be great to get your perspective. I know your community uh, has been impacted by COVID-19. It was towards the end of the year where we saw a large spike in COVID-19 cases. The New York Times reported on it as well. Um, Grant County, um, uh, you know, one of the highest spikes in the country at that time in November, I believe it was. Um, your thoughts on the removal of the mask um, mandate, and do you have any concerns with this? So uh, the the nice thing about this, Anthony, for myself, is that because I'm a funeral director, I actually get upfront information about my area, and I cover a big footprint, pretty much the whole Southwest. There, I think the mask mandate um, at this point, it, it needed to to go. Um, there are, I, I have children, and so I take them to. They, I still have an 11 year old and a 14 year old, and I've seen literally kids with a footprint of their sh their shoe footprint on their mask, and going, oh, I need a mask to get into school, and so that's also unhealthy. I, you see masks that are dingy and dirty and. Um, maybe they don't have the, the, the proper masking. So here, here's, here's the thing. Um, masks are just one facet of, of health, of being healthy. I think different people need to, you need to know your own, um, you, you yourself know your health better than anybody else. And although the, the mask is so, something that, that, um, is one of the things that are used, it's not the only thing to prevent, um, this virus. As a funeral director, the key thing is um, when, because we we're dealing with not just the, the human remains that, that have, you know, or people that have passed away from the virus, but are their families who also have been infected. And so I, I told my staff, listen, stick to the, to your training, wash your hands, don't touch your face, um, be smart, space yourselves, um, and, and just use the training that you've, that you've been, that you've been used to and what we've been doing for many years of, of disinfecting and so forth. We've been doing this it, it, my business for 15 years. Yeah. I mean, this isn't it's new to us. So, uh, you know, although there are 
there are people that that I let me go back. I think the messaging that we had, we're all focusing on masks and vaccination mandates. I think what was lost is the the discussion of getting treatment, getting uh, automatically. If you had any symptoms, go ahead and 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 uh, quarantine yourself. Get tested immediately and seek med medical attention. So you think it was a communication I'll issue that that really could have been done better by health officials? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. I want to. Okay. I, 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 I want to finish. I want to. Well, finish I, I'll let you finish, but there's there's other things I want to talk with you about. We only have okay. a, about five minutes left. Okay. Let me finish that real quick. The reason I say that is Anthony. You had people that were vaccinated as a funeral director. People have died with vac being vaccinated and still contracted the virus and still passed away. And so people felt. Some people felt, "Hey, I'm 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 immune because I got the vaccination." Whether you're vaccinated or not, you should have, everyone should seek medical attention immediately and monitor it closely. And I think people were also felt that they were ostracized if they got, if they contracted the virus and, you know, and, and felt like, oh my gosh, I don't want anyone to know. So what do they, they avoid going to the doctor? They, yeah. they um, pretend that they're not sick. And so I think we lost some of the, the, the as a state, the communication to the public of the importance of not just whether it was ma uh, the masking or the vaccination, but really the true issue was they should have gone to get tested and seek medical attention quickly. Those and people that, that waited seven to 14 days are the ones that passed away that were healthy. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk with you about another issue um, that has to do with uh, the pandemic in your area, and that was a shortage of nurses. There's been a lot of concern about the shortage of health officials, of course, in rural areas. You serve on the committee. What are some things in this legislative session that you think uh, happened that could address that shortage? So I had I had I had discussions with CEOs and 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 so forth, uh, and and county officials concerning that. The problem is that we have a pool of nurses throughout the United States that we're all trying to fight for the same pool. So I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, are, but we'll just say that there's a million nurses that are nece necessary in, in order to to fully um, employ or, or fill all the. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of this. New Mexico has faced this challenge for a long time, but I'd like to hear from yeah. you in this legislative session, in this budget. What are some things that you think can address that shortage that may make a difference? It was it was a return to work. I'm telling you, because it, it, it was the our only opportunity. Look, we're not going to have nurses. I, I talked to. Uh, I talked to the, the uh, president of the university for the nursing, uh, you know, the nursing school. How can we, how can we get more students, not only, you know, uh, certified, but how can we get them retained in our area? Because mm -hmm. they're leaving, you know, they can be a traveling nurse. Let's just say in Las Cruces, you can be a traveling nurse and just go to El Paso. And now you're competing with another state and you're getting better, uh, income and you're just traveling 50 40 50 miles those are the challenges that we have and again we're it comes down to a pool we have a shortage of nurses throughout the country and every every single state every single hospital is fighting for the same nurses and so what's happening is it's basically supply and demand uh the demand is high shortage of supplies yet some of these smaller municipalities like mine can't, we can't afford to compete with the the large hospitals, the big the big corporations. So those are issues that the only way we're going to be able to, what I in, in, in from my perspective, we it's only growing more nurses and asking nurses to come back to work and giving them incentives to do that. There has to be a cap, though. Some of these uh, agencies are taking advantage. I think. Of, of the staffing agencies mm -hmm. are taking advantage. Um, they're up at $200 an hour, 200 and some dollars an hour. And sometimes I've even heard of, of, of some of the CEOs complaining that even though they hired them at, let's just say that that rate, then even though they hadn't completed their, their uh, contract, they're already negotiating for a higher rate um, in, in, in the middle of that contract, yeah. that has to be, they need to cap that so that it gives us smaller municipalities, a better, uh, competitive 
uh, you know, so we have a, at least a competitive uh, uh, environment because yeah. it's just too tough. Interesting. Yes, I look forward to following up with you. We only have a minute left, but I'd like to hear you? from you. Uh, you know, moving forward, what do you think are the biggest challenges in your district that still need to be addressed that lawmakers in Santa Fe can help make a difference in? I think, you know, we're, we're still seeing the effects of, of COVID, um, the, 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 the rippling effect that it had on businesses, the closures that, that were mandated by the, by the state. We're still seeing the scars of all of that throughout my district, restaurants that will not open, uh, people not returning back to work, um, not feeling whether they're not feeling safe or they're financially um, getting uh, state assistance and, and, and federal assistance, keeping them home. I think um, we have to um, work. Oh, I don't know. You know, we, we passed some nice stuff, uh, Social Security income exemption, things like that, that are going to help some people. But, you know, when we have these, um, there's so many issues, uh, yeah. Anthony, that, that there's not just one thing. It's very different. Uh, it's a very different situation. Yeah. Um, I, in my, my district has changed, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, I'm now in, in Grant County. And, and so I'm more speaking in, in that tone because that's where I'll be now representing. I see. Uh, well, unfortunately, we, we are out of time. Uh, I have to stop you right there. But I do want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us, State Representative Luis Terrazas. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you, Anthony. You're great. Appreciate it. And see you next year. Con el favor de Dios. All right. And we also want to thank you for joining us for this season of Your Legislators. I'm Anthony Renault. We'll see you next time.